you praise the Lord for those opportunities. I, I've been involved in several interims where we have done the uh, baby bottle. And again, as Michael said, uh, the green paper and checks help fill it up better for, for both everybody involved. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's hard to remember to bring it back, but you, you have to do that too. But good, good, good. We're in Matthew 28 today. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. I love being your interim pastor, trying to provide some leadership for you, and I love proclaiming the word to you. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Would you stand as I read this passage to you? Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may be seated. Uh, Last minute instructions are always important. Here Jesus gives last minute instructions before his ascension. But yet it's much deeper than that. We're on a journey a journey with Matthew to the cross. Well, we reach the cross, and there Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, Jesus, the God-man, sinless, perfect, died on the cross for our sins. Died for my sins, for your sins, for the sins of the whole world. Jesus was the atoning sacrifice, propitiation, a sacrifice, sin sacrifice for us on that cross. He died, they buried him, and then he arose. Three days later, he arose, and he's now the resurrected Lord. This passage, though verse 19 gets much emphasis, I want to put much emphasis today on the idea of Jesus being the resurrected Lord. Here in this passage, shortly after His uh, resurrection, Jesus gathered His disciples and gave them what we call the Great Commission. And then soon afterward was His ascension. So the resurrected Jesus... The one who died, the one who was buried, the one who came back to life. The resurrected Jesus gave the great commission to his disciples. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we should understand and obey the great commission. Today I want us to take a new look at the... The Great Commission here in the context with emphasis upon the resurrection of Jesus to try to understand it from that perspective and for us to be reminded and move forward both individually and congregationally in obeying this Great Commission. It is the adventure of the ages. It is the joy of all of what God is about. It is the commission, the assignment that He has given us. So let's look at some parts, some parts of this great passage. First is the authority of the resurrected Jesus. The authority. Verse 18, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The word authority is quite an interesting word. It's not dunamis, a very prominent word in the New Testament where we get our word dynamite, about power. But no, the word here is exousia. It simply means authority or rightful rule. 
Jesus is claiming rightful rule or legitimate jurisdiction over all of heaven and earth. Uh, the word is drawn from a word that was used in that day as the rightful heir of a throne. Jesus is the rightful heir of the throne of all of heaven. Of all of heaven and earth, all authority belongs to him. Now why? Why does it? Well, partly because of his deity. He's the God-man. He's God's Son. God made flesh, partly because of his deity. He has the right to claim the authority over all of heaven and earth. But partly because, and probably most important in this context, because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Again, Jesus went to the cross to die a sacrificial sin atoning death for you, for me, for every person in the, on the earth. They buried him and he rose again. And in his resurrection there's victory over death, victory over sin, victory over the grave. Because of these, yes, he has the right to claim all authority over me, over you, over the church, over all of heaven and earth. The resurrected Jesus has the right to do this, to claim, to have rightful rule over all of heaven and earth. That makes him our authority in every way. He has the right to tell us to do anything and we should do it. He has the right to set our agenda the Lord Jesus, the authority, the authority of the resurrected Jesus. Now I recognize that's all of heaven and earth. That includes you, includes me, includes our congregation. And what does this matter? How does it matter? Well, it, with this uh, statement in verse 18, many people... Focusing on this passage, put great emphasis on verse 19. We'll try to do that in a minute. But I believe verse 18 is crucial. If Jesus is not telling us the truth here, if He is lying to us about verse 18, then what does verse 19 mean to us? Nothing. It means nothing to us. But if Jesus is telling us the truth in verse 18, which He is, then what does verse 19 mean to us? It means everything to us. Because of who He is, the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected Lord. Jesus rose from the dead, so He gets to call the shots. Jesus is alive, so He gets to set the agenda. If this resurrected Jesus had have told us to save all the owls, what should we do? Save the owls. If this resurrected Jesus had told us to make dollhouses, what should we do? We should be the best dollhouse makers in the world. Jesus told us to grow catawba worms. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, south of Graceful, there's a Catawba worm farm. This guy's got an orchard. He's got some trees. He trims those trees. He mows the grass around them. Keeps it all. I don't know how many Catawba worms he makes. But it looks good. We ought to be the best farmers in the world if that was the case. He has the right, the authority to give us instructions, to give us commands, to give us a commission. That takes us from the authority of the resurrected Jesus to the assignment of the resurrected Jesus. Verses 19 and 20. Let's read it again. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. So the risen Lord, 
the risen Jesus gave some instructions. What were those instructions? They must be important to us since He is the resurrected Jesus. Now I have sermon series on this passage, on this verse. I must be brief here. There's one main verb in this passage. We usually translate it, make disciples. The assignment of the resurrected Jesus is to make disciples. This word, it's, it's one word in Greek. Uh, it, it has the, the verb, uh, it's a verb, but it has that noun, disciple, within it. It's about a student, a learner, a follower. It's the idea of a person attaching himself or herself to a teacher or a leader to learn from that teacher and to follow, to do what that teacher says. Thus the verb to make disciples means for us to help persons, to help persons become and to be followers of Jesus, students of Jesus, those who obey what he tells us to do. This main verb, make disciples, is surrounded by three participles. These three participles, go, baptize, and teach, take on, because of this context, imperative force. An imperative force that they take on and thus we should treat them as imperative commands. When you see this main verb, make disciples, and these three participles, we end up with four imperative actions from this passage. To go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. Four imperative actions. We're to go. Go to the nations. Go next door. Go down the street. Go across town. Go across the nation. Go around the world. We're to make disciples. In this context, that would mean to evangelize them. Help persons get started. Help persons get started as followers of Jesus. Then we're to baptize them. Immerse them in water as a testimony of their beginning obedience to the Lord Jesus. Then we're to teach them. It's the word, Greek word didasko, which is where we get our word didactic and deductive. It points to systematic, ongoing, organized instruction. Something you don't get done in a day. You don't get it done in a week. It's ongoing. Ongoing instruction to help people to start obeying Jesus. Not to give them a head full of mush. But to help us obey the Lord Jesus. Let me try to give you a summary of this commission, a summary of this command. To say it in a different way, to help us to uh, pull together what Jesus is saying. Our mission is to help persons from all nations become and be followers and obeyers of Jesus. Well, maybe I'm coining a new word there, obeyers. But I think that helps to convey the thought here. Our commission, our assignment is to help persons from all nations become and to be followers and obeyers of Jesus. Again, I remind you, this is not Jumper's idea. This is not our denomination's mission, though we should adopt it. We do. Whose is it? It belongs to the Lord Jesus. The resurrected Jesus gives us this commission. The Lord over all, the authority over all of heaven and earth, over you, over me, commands and commissions us 
to help persons from all nations become and to be followers and obeyers of Jesus. Well, today, because of the context in the uh, discussions in our nation, in our society, and somewhat in our church, I want us to address a few things today of what this commission or the assignment is not. Now that list could be quite long. We could talk at length about uh, what is not our assignment here. But let me address two that are prominent themes in our culture and in our society to help us to understand more about them maybe, but also more about the commission, the assignment that the Lord has given us. First, we need to say that our commission is not today's social justice movement. Is it biblical for believers to help with injustice and with the oppressed? Well, yes, absolutely. But we must make sure that we do it in a biblical way. Not the world's way that's being promoted today. The world wants to ram down our throats its way of doing things and helping our society. Certainly there are some real issues that need to be addressed. Some real issues and good issues that need to be addressed. But much of the chatter today is simply an attempt to legitimize Uh, deviant, moral, and sexual lifestyles. We must recognize that. So our commission is not today's social justice movement. We must be sure. Again, our society is pushing that upon us. Our society is trying to move everybody in that direction. But we must be sure that we do not replace the Great Commission with that agenda. Uh, Christian history is full of the church getting off track. One of those instances is uh, what was called the social gospel movement of the 1920s. It started out simply enough as an attempt to feed the hungry. We as believers need to feed the hungry. Well, we do. Jesus did. The church is called to do some of that. However... When that became the main focus, it wasn't long before the theology went awry. There's no heaven, no hell, and salvation was simply meeting people's needs here on the earth. The gospel was distorted. I want to emphasize to you today that the only real solution to the injustices in our society... Yes, there are some. The only real reason to the only real solution to the injustices in our society is for the church to help persons one at a time to become followers and obeyers of Jesus. The government can't do it. They'll do it wrong. Man can't do it. It is the work of the church and the only approach that will work is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus and this commission of helping persons to become and to be followers and obeyers of Jesus. Any other approach besides the biblical way is like putting band-aids on a flesh wound. It simply won't work. Are there Matters in our society that believers need to take a stand. Some of them a stand against and some of them a stand for. Well, yes, absolutely. We need to stand against things like abortion, sexual abuse, child abuse, racism, poverty, etc., We need to stand for things like pro-life, orphan care and widow care, like James emphasizes to us. The adoption and fostering movement that's prominent in our church and in uh, the world, Christian world today. 
uh, I, I see the adoption movement as, as simply intensive discipling. 24-7 <laughs> discipling work. Praise God for that. But all of these matters, all of these agendas must work with the Great Commission. Everything else must be subordinate to the Great Commission. It must be a part of, it must lead to the Great Commission. It must supplement the Great Commission. Uh, Secondary to it, not replacing the Great Commission, but working toward it, working with the Great Commission, but also it needs to be submissive to the authority, the authority of the risen Jesus, done the Lord's way, under the authority of Jesus, with His resources, the Word of God and the Gospel of the Lord Jesus. So we've addressed the idea of today's social justice movement. Secondly, let's think about today's racial justice movement. In the gospel, Jesus has declared all racism wrong. All racism as sin. And he's called the church, he's commissioned the church to make disciples, followers of Jesus of all nations. That includes all races, all ethnic groups. In the book of Revelation, it points to the idea of those being who is in heaven, uh, of every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every ethnic group across our world. Let me emphasize for you, Jesus Christ died to save from sin every human being because we are all sinners. God has called us called the church to help us get that message to every human being. Today, if you have one cell in your body that's racist, you need to repent. Repent of that racism and be right about it. But the only way, the only way we can solve these problems in our nation... The racial problems in our nation is to help persons to start thinking like Jesus, obeying Jesus, helping persons to become and to be followers of Jesus and obeyers of Jesus. Through the gospel, there must be a radical change in people's lives. A change that only the gospel can give. We must help them with it. The government can't do that. Man can't do that. Only the gospel can do that. Only the church can help with that. That help won't come through what's typically called critical race theory or BLM. We need to understand that these are man-made worldly approaches that will continue to divide and make things worse. They come from a flawed source. They make false claims and advocate a divisive and unbiblical solution. The Bible is sufficient. The gospel is sufficient. The gospel is powerful to transform lives. To transform the lives of the racist and of the person he's racist against. Because we all need it. We all need the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus. We need that transformation of Jesus that helps us all to start thinking and working like Jesus. That's the only real solution to these problems. There's a lot of chatter, a lot of ideas thrown around about this in our day. I believe America has made... More progress faster with this matter than any other nation. Have we been too slow in that progress? Yes. But we've been faster than any other nation. Also, I'm convinced that America is not the problem. The American system is not the problem. Sinful people are the problem. Sinful people on the inside of the system. Sinful people on the outside of the system. 
Again, we're all sinners. We all are in need of the grace of the Lord Jesus. All in need of transformation of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, our call, our challenge, our commission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus and to help persons, every person, to become a follower of Jesus and an obeyer of Jesus. Now let me address the postponement of secret church. Um, Recognize nobody has canceled secret church. Uh, We have chosen to postpone it until further review. To use a sports term. There's a lot of hot topics. Two of them we've addressed today. A lot of hot topics in our nation. And sometimes they affect our church. And sometimes those topics can be very divisive. And this is also a time when many people are going a a direction that uh, they probably shouldn't be going. Uh, Sometimes going the world's direction with their thoughts. It's affecting a lot of churches. Our church is not the only one that's having these discussions. Sometimes the problem is simply overemphasizing good things. But we must make sure that the content is biblical. That the content will help us as a congregation rather than hurt us as a congregation. We must make sure that the content is such that uh, as a right balance upon These matters that says the right things, that does not say the the wrong things, and says what needs to be said to help us. Uh, The leadership and I will review the content. I realize that prohibits the the live part of it. That can't be helped. Uh, If the content is okay, and I expect it to be, If it's biblical, we'll show it in about a month, sometime in May probably. But if not, again, I chose to err on the side of caution. To err on the side of caution. This church needs to move forward past some of these things. And we didn't need something that was going to hurt it, hurt those problems. So if... If everything's good, we'll show it. If not, we'll move another direction. So we have an assignment. An assignment from the Lord Jesus. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that you as an individual, if you're not already, you need to become a follower of Jesus. The real proof in the pudding is whether you're obeying Jesus or not. Maybe you need to become a real follower of Jesus today. I encourage you about that. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And he calls every person across our world to repent and turn to Jesus, trusting him, submitting life to him. If that's something you've already done, this assignment reminds us that we need to be active, an active follower and obeyer. Of Jesus, We need to be passionate. We need to dig in with learning more about Him and obeying Him more and more. This assignment reminds us that we as a congregation have work to do and good work to do. Of taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus, making disciples glo- locally, regionally, and globally. We need to win more people. We need to help more people become followers of Jesus here in Crestview and beyond. We need to be involved in church planting in Crestview and around our nation. We need to be more involved with our cooperative program of sending the gospel across the world. Helping our international mission board, North American mission board with their work of taking the message of Jesus and helping them. Yes, but us being involved in uh, the work here and the work across our world. 
our Jesus is alive. So whatever it takes to be on task with Him will be worth it. We need to trust Him on that. Well, we've addressed the assurance of the resurrected I'm sorry, we've addressed the authority of the resurrected Jesus and the assignment of the resurrected Jesus, but now the assurance of the resurrected Jesus. In the latter part of verse 20, Jesus makes this statement. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus made a promise here. But what is it about? Well, some folks think it's about the security of the believer. I believe in the absolute security of the believer. If a person has been genuinely born again, they will always be in Christ. Always born again for eternity. But that's not what this passage is about. Neither is this passage about a blank check. Some folks think, well, Jesus has just given us a blank check. He'll always be with us. My dad used to send us when we were out working on the farm. He'd send me to the local store to get supplies. But he never gave me a blank check. He knew better. (laughs) It would not have been good. God doesn't give us a blank check either. So what is this passage about? I believe we have to understand it in light of Jesus' authority. We have to to understand it in light of His assignment. If we're not yielding to His authority, if we're not working on His assignment, then no. He's not going to do anything for us. But if we are yielding to His authority and working on His assignment, then yes... Absolutely yes. The resurrected Jesus will put His presence, His power, His empowering upon the work that we do. If we're following His assignment and following His assignment His way. We have a promise here. A guarantee. An assurance that the resurrected Jesus will be with us. When we are working on His assignment. The resurrected Jesus will walk with us. His presence will be with us as we obey Him. Folks, that's something we want in on. If we're on somebody under somebody else's authority, on on our own agenda... We'll do it ourselves. But if we are yielded to Him, we are working on His assignment, He promises us He will infuse it with Holy Spirit power to make it fruitful. We need to be in on that. There are a lot of reasons for His resurrection. But here, one reason for His resurrection is to help us. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't give us this assignment and tell us to go out and figure it out how to do it on our own and do it in our own power? He says, I'll be with you. I will help you. You follow me, obey me, and I will infuse your work with His very presence. Can we trust Him to do that? Yes, we can. We can trust Him. Let's bow our heads together, please. Our musicians are going to return and lead lead us in another wonderful worship song. But I want you to do more than just sing during these moments. I want you to think about your response to the claims of Jesus and the claims of this passage. It may be that you need to begin as a follower of Jesus. Our staff would love to have conversation time with you. You could start that during this song. Pastor Michael and I will be here to help you. You can see us afterward. You can contact us. You can see us in a lot of different ways anytime. And we'll 
work hard to have that conversation with you. The Lord God, the Lord Jesus, loves you and sent Jesus to die on the cross for you and wants you to know Him and to follow Him and obey Him. The greatest joy and adventure on planet earth and beyond. If you already are a follower of Jesus, again, this this assignment calls us to dig in. To continue being a follower. Continue being an obeyer. And find ways to, to dig in and within a local church to serve Him with this assignment. If you want to talk about how you need to move forward in your following, your obeying... If you want to talk with someone about your participation in this congregation, we'd love to have that conversation again now or after or any time or using the starting point class. We want to help you with being obedient to Jesus, being obedient to this great commission. Father, help us. Guide us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your great challenge to us. Thank you for the resurrected Jesus who makes it all worthwhile. Lord, lead us and help us. Help us all as we make decisions about your claim upon us in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.